Hey, well, for all of you that are on right now, thank you for joining us uh, for this uh, uh, virtual uh, counseling today with uh, Liz Castile. Um, just a couple of things. Uh, this is going to be taped today, uh, and we're going to send it out to folks uh, tomorrow as well, uh, but you get to hear it uh, live. Uh, Liz is going to begin with a short presentation, and then uh, she and I will be going back and forth in a, in a dialogue format, uh, hopefully answering some of the questions that you may have as we walk through this. Um, and, and then we'll stop about one o'clock or so. So that's the way the format's going to be. So let me open up with a word of prayer, and then I'm going to have uh, Liz introduce herself to us. Father, we just want to say thank you for uh, the opportunity we have. Thank you for the technology that we're able to speak to Liz, who's in Colorado on vacation, uh, and yet uh, uh, we're able to do this live right now. And so we're thankful for that uh, opportunity. Lord, thank you for Liz as well uh, on vacation, and yet she saw the opportunity to help me meet a need that we have at Interstate. And so I just pray you'd bless her for her service to us today. Uh, for all the families that are home, uh, that are wrestling with uh, this reality that we're experiencing right now, I pray that you would give us your peace, the peace that passes understanding. And so as we start this today, Lord, we just want to commit this to you. And I pray that uh, the conversation that we have today would encourage families, would strengthen families, would uh, point families to the hope that we have. And so we just ask for your blessing on this today. So we want to commit it to you now in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, Liz, can you uh, give us a, a little uh, heads up about who you are? And, uh, um, you know, I want to say at the outset that I've known you for some time now. I've met with you a few times. We've talked on the phone and uh, we at Interstate have been blessed because of the relationship. So if you could just spend a couple of minutes and tell us about who you are. Oh, sure, sure. Yeah, thanks, Henry. I actually really um, welcomed this invitation. I, I think that as a licensed counselor there in Dallas and um, I mean, suffering is a part of what I talk about every day. It's also a part of my own life. So, you know, I'm on this roller coaster the way that everybody is. It's amidst uncertainty. It's amidst affliction. And so, um, anyway, so I do appreciate this opportunity. Uh, I'm the director of a counseling center called Nikeo, which started about 15 years ago. And the, the, it's a Greek word, and it, this is not a plug for Nikeo, but this is really, I think, interesting that the Greek word Nikeo means to have victory over to overcome, um, and that's really this road that, that we're on, is, is how are we going to overcome this adversity that we're all experiencing? And um, so I'm hoping through our time together, I can just offer some encouragement um, and hopefully give some, some tools, actually, and would love any kind of questions, too, and it's not that I'll have all the answers to it, but um, perhaps just chewing on some of this stuff together to figure out how we can get through a roller coaster ride. And some people do better on roller coasters than others. Some mm -hmm. are going to be more resilient than others. And I've experienced that, that yes, I actually came here to be on vacation, but I think in light of, you know, this thing kind of ramping up some, I have actually been doing virtual sessions. And so with my clients, you know, I am seeing those that are more resilient through it and those that are really moving into a lot of anxiety. So, you know, I'm having that, that road too. Of, of walking through that. So I realize some of this, these listeners here are going to be on different ends of the spectrum, perhaps, and how they're handling this. So a lot of what I'll be talking about, too, is from a faith perspective, because obviously, you know, Henry and Missy, you guys are in the chaplain department there, and Nikeo is a, is a faith-based counseling center. Um, my master's in counseling is from Denver Seminary, so from, you know, 25 years ago. So I've been counseling for um, about that long. And so hopefully we can just glean some encouragement from each other, other over the next hour. Good, thank you. That's that's awesome, and we're we're thrilled to have you here today. Thank you. Yeah, I think our our big thing, as I as I thought and prayed last night about just what to address, is how can we learn to sit in discomfort because we cannot change our current circumstances. We we actually, you know, I hear a lot of people that I'm talking to over this past week feeling like they're completely out of control. And in some ways they are. That's that's the reality. I mean, I think our financial situations with the stock market feels out of control. We certainly have no control over how, you know, this this virus is this coronavirus is going to um continue to take off. Um but we do have control over how we respond, whether we respond or react. Um, we do have some control over not necessarily our feelings about it, 
but what we're going to do with those feelings. And so I don't necessarily know that we have to feel like we're completely powerless. Um, that's a lot of what I'm hearing from folks that I'm talking to uh, in our, my virtual sessions is this real fear, and fear is oftentimes about powerlessness, as the same with anxiety. So, again, perhaps in our time together, we can learn some tools about how not to panic, um, how not to just focus on the negative side of this, recognizing that, yes, it's uncomfortable and it is anxiety provoking, but we do have some some control in that. I actually was reminded a lot of Paul, in, in all honesty, because there's a couple of things when he wrote the Corinthians four about being hard pressed on every side. Mm -hmm. He always acknowledges feeling hard pressed or feeling perplexed or feeling persecuted, but then he follows it up very quickly by saying, "But we're not crushed. We we shouldn't be in despair. We are not abandoned." And we are not being destroyed. And it's really his encouraging us that this is our way to experience suffering that is purposeful. And I'm not going to give these simple Sunday school answers, and I don't expect that what I just said is going to make everybody, you know, automatically feel better. But one of the other things I, I want um, you guys to know about Paul, which which you may already know, depending on how much you um, have read his writings, is um, he has this great – uh, when he wrote his letter to the Philippians, and it's in Philippians 4, and he says that I have learned the secret of being content in every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. He was actually sitting in a prison cell. It, he was on his second missionary journey, um, and he gets put in prison, obviously, for the message that he was trying to, um, you know, preach to people. But um, I actually have a picture of the prison where where most theologians and commentarians um, would think that he was. And this prison was maybe 10 feet long and maybe about six or eight feet high. And it was dug out the, the side of a mountain. Okay, so it was different than his, his prison in Rome. The prison in Rome was under the city streets. And it was a lot larger, actually. And he could walk around. He was literally in chains, but he could walk around this prison. That was not this prison in Philippi, or it was actually in Macedonia. This prison was really small, and at one point, he and Silas were in there together. So two guys are sharing this really small prison, and that is where he wrote those words, I am content in every situation. Again, I don't think Paul liked it. You know, that being content is very different than liking a situation, and that really resonated with me, you guys, is thinking, you know, we feel that way, especially in light of a quarantine, um, depending on what that looks like for different people. Some are still going out and some aren't. But we're going to feel that. We're going to feel that we're in these kind of stuck in these close quarters and can't go do what we want. And I have to believe that if Paul somehow could learn to be content, again, not liking it, but content, that there's got to be something in that for us in the midst of this uncertainty. I don't know, Henry, if that resonates with you or if it makes sense to you as you hear that. Right now? Okay. Um, yeah, it makes me okay. wonder, too, with the fact that he was with Silas, uh, what impact that would have had on him being content that he that he wasn't alone. Um, he knew he wasn't alone with God, for sure, but he also had a, a, a friend, a fellow worker with him. So that speaks a yeah, lot of relationship. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely, because, again, I think so many people feel isolated in this. But I don't think that they have to be fully isolated. Um, certainly the people that I'm talking to, the ones that are being more resilient through this time are those ones that are looking outside of themselves. And because it's really easy for, for any of us to become so anxious, and then we just zoom in on, you know, the, kind of the doom and gloom. Henry, I said this to you, I think maybe before others logged in, but when you guys asked me to do this, you know, I'm not glued to the TV. I'm not glued to watching the news. Um, but over the last couple of days, after I got the email from Misty, I began to kind of look at some of this stuff and read, you know, some blogs and listen to some podcasts. And I will say that the majority of them were, were really negative and highly anxious. And I'm not highly anxious at all. Yeah. Um, I'm very aware of what's going on, but I also think that some of, how can I think outside of myself? And that's, that's some of why I'm glad I'm sitting right here today is because I thought this is an opportunity for me 
to Mm -hmm. kind of give. And I think we have a choice every day during this whole ordeal, whether to move into kind of the selflessness of one anothering or kind of our anxiety that might cause us to become selfish and, um, and isolate more. And I do think that that is something we have control over. Again, there's a lot of things we don't have control over, but these are some of the things we have control over. Yeah, that's been one of my concerns, because if you remember 9-11, the CNN at the time, this was pre-Twitter, pre-Instagram, pre-Facebook, but uh, CNN kept showing those planes hitting the tower over and over and over, and eventually they said, hey, we got to stop doing this, and people became glued to watching that over and over. Uh, Well, today, we have more than just the TV set. We've got all these other uh, opportunities. So what would you say to the person that is feeling uh, glued to watching the latest briefing or the latest information? What would you say to them? Yeah, so I would actually, and I feel pretty strongly about this, I would encourage them to not be having the TV on, the radio on, watching podcasts. Again, that's where I've been a little bit um, detached from it, but yet I want to be I want to be aware and I want to be informed, but that ourselves to be inundated by the news, you know, watching the disease graphs, right? I mean, now you can download apps of how, you know, COVID-19 is spreading, not just in the United States or in Texas, but across the world. You can download all that stuff. And I certainly, um, you know, have been talking to people this week that they're inundated by it and it's, it's causing an obsession, which is now turning into some really high anxiety. So what I've been practicing over the last couple of weeks is I check in with the news once a day. And that's just to get the highlight of how do I stay informed um, myself, but also to help others as I'm counseling others through this. But that's all I'm doing. And then I'm practicing some things in my routine that are helpful, but also outside of my routine. And we can you know, talk more about that. But I really, and as hard as it might be, is to to not have the TV on all day, especially in households where there's children, um, because children are going to pick up on kind of the barometer. You know, barometer measures mm-hmm. pressure in the atmosphere, um, but barometer in this circumstance is going to measure pressure and stress and a change of circumstances. And so if I were to sit and watch the news or scroll through even social media, because there's a lot of news on social media, um, I think it would affect the fact that I really don't have high anxiety about what's going on. And so I choose not to do that. It's a conscious decision that I make every day um, because I do see that most of the people that I'm talking to and and the the counsel that I'm giving them is, would you be willing to really practice some, some discipline in what you're putting in front of your eyes and what you're listening to because it's exacerbating the darkness that that is around this. Yeah, that's good. I think the media may feel some pressure to keep it going 24 hours a day and we may not be having that many changes. So I think there's a lot of wisdom in what you said. Uh, what what about for those that are feeling uh, stressed or anxious? Do you have any, any techniques uh, to help deal with that? If we're going to be pulling yeah, away from the so TV I- set, so what, what do we do? Yeah, absolutely. So I'm a big fan of what I just call the art of distraction. And that is not to live in denial, which again, I want to be clear, I'm not living in denial here while I'm on vacation. I'm just, I'm practicing the art of distraction, which is what am I filling my mind with? And it might sound like just a simple thing, but it, it even if I'm going to turn on the TV or watch a movie or put on Netflix or Amazon Prime movies or whatever, it is, what is that that I'm exposing myself to? And so right now it, it's, humorous movies. Um, So, you know, last night I watched uh, Steve Martin's Dirty Rotten Scoundrels. I mean, it's an old movie, but I think it's hysterical. And it has nothing to do with this. And that's really different than even watching a TV show like CSI or something that triggers anxiety. Um, There's a part of our brain in the very front. It's about the size of a walnut. It's called the amygdala. And it's basically the anxiety gatekeeper. And so any time that our anxiety is increasing, it's because our amygdala is getting triggered and it's in the front top of your forehead. And so again, anytime somebody watches anything on TV, news that is stressful, um, a TV show that's stressful, um, it triggers the amygdala. And so again, that's a choice that I'm making right now is to, to that is something I do have control over is what I'm what I'm exposing myself to. That's a big one. 
um, there's kind of three really important things that can help with anxiety or even some, some depression as people are feeling isolated and their routine is completely different now. And that is exercise. That would be my number one, um, you know, is just daily, even if somebody has never been an exerciser and it could simply be a walk around the block. Um, I do think that that is still okay, depending on where you live. And if some people feel uncomfortable with that, I understand, but I do think where things are in the, in the Dallas area, but even I think in the United States, I'm not sure with New York and Washington being the two main states that have the most cases, but Mm -hmm. um, to get outside, I realize it's been raining a lot in Dallas, but there's something to be said about fresh air um, that is different than being on a treadmill. Although if treadmill or elliptical or whatever is all that you've got, um, I think that's fine. So exercise is a big one, good nutrition. And that doesn't mean that you can't eat, you know, the snack foods and the cookies and all that, but it just means that um, there's all kinds of research out there that talks about the importance of protein um, mostly coming from, you know, meats, fish, and then certainly vegetables um, that that increases the serotonin in our brain. And serotonin is um, one of the primary um, just chemicals in our brain, God-given, we're born with that, and dopamine, and both of those kind of regulate anxiety and depression. And then the third one is sleep. Um, this was a study out of Stanford. I think people will laugh at this when I say it, but it's the, the latest study that says people need eight hours and 15 minutes of uninterrupted sleep. And again, I'm sure people are chuckling right now when I say that because I think most people don't get it. But I would say um, it's a pretty reliable study that in the midst of this uncertainty, in the midst of this pandemic, can exercise be a priority, can good nutrition be a priority, mm-hmm. and sleep um, would be the three things that I do think, again, we, we have control over. Um, and that's where, that's where I would start on that. Yeah, that's good. Uh, would anything change if for those that would say, hey, I'm not depressed today, I don't feel a great level of anxiety, would you add anything to that list to prevent them from going that direction? Or are or, or the four that you gave from the, uh, what are we filling our mind with, the exercise, the nutrition, the sleep, uh, if if we do those four things, then that'll help us prevent us from moving towards depression. Is there anything you would add to that? Yeah. Yeah. I think there's things um, that you could add because there's things that I'm adding too, because, you know, I always kind of keep a list of things that maybe I've wanted to get done, but our lives are so busy and my life can be so busy that now there may be some more wiggle room and it may not be true for everybody. Again, I'm, you know, I certainly know that um, there's a lot of employees at IB that still, you know, are working and have things to do. But I think in light of that, to help, you know, battle or keep away anxiety that might creep in, it's doing things that you've wanted to do. I mean, you know, whether it's you create a new recipe or if you have a family, you're playing games at night. Maybe, you know, you've never um, made that a high priority to do a lot of family time. And I think this could be a perfect time to kind of move into the one anothering and and creating um, just just a fun time around the unknown. Um, I, I know some families that are making gratitude lists and they're keeping that on the refrigerator or um, one family has a big piece of butcher paper and it's hanging up on a closet door and anybody can add to it at any time. And again, that's not to be in denial about what's going on, but it's recognizing that there's there can always be a dichotomy in the midst of suffering. And I really do believe that because that's again what Paul says, the dichotomy of he's content in the situation while he's sitting in a prison. It's the dichotomy of we can't control certain things. We can't control, you know, our our retirement funds in the stock market, but we can control the feel around the home. Um, And to be gratitude, to be, to be grateful for certain things that are happening. I mean, I can make a gratitude list, you know, every day that that I'm sitting here, even when I come back to to Dallas, that's something that, that I can choose to do. Um, I think it's trying new things. I have a, um, a guy friend of mine that always wanted to take watercolor, um, and he's a, just he's an attorney there in Dallas, and um, you know he has decided to do these online watercolor classes, mm. and he's done that for a week now, and it has just kind of awakened him. Um, there's some other things that I think can be really helpful when anxiety creeps in. So apart from that, you know, exercise and good nutrition and and being grateful. Um, I talked about watching funny movies or just, I mean, you can watch family movies. Um, When anxiety starts to creep in, that's a physiological 
response in our body. Okay, we'll feel it. I mean, it could even be shortness of breath. It could be clammy hands. Um, I'm trying to help somebody right now that's checking their Fidelity accounts every morning. And of course, they're freaking out. And so mm -hmm. I'm trying to help them understand how that impacts their physiology and their body. And they've got to change that because if we're sitting in front of a computer all day, since a lot of us are doing remote work now, um, it's something that I'm practicing too because, you know, my sessions are 50 minutes. And so even throughout that, I'm changing how I sit. Um, I have a bottle of water or, or hot tea or something next to me at all times because even picking up a bottle of water, taking a sip of it, changes my body physiology, okay? And so it can retract kind of the brain and how the brain is working. Um, we often don't know that when we're getting nervous or having increased anxiety that our breaths are more shallow. And I'm not talking about a panic attack, although that's obviously an eye-opener and it will certainly, you know, mm -hmm. people say, oh my gosh, yes, I'm having a panic attack. But I would say that the majority of people right now are not breathing deep and they're having kind of shallow breathing and it's not letting as much oxygen into our, into our lungs. And so we've got to work at sitting and opening up our chest and um, stretching that out. And that's another way that we can take control. It helps us practice resilience through this. Um, and I practice that throughout the day, um, is just how, how am I paying attention to my body that when I do hear something, and again, the last couple of days, because I decided to kind of expose myself more to perhaps what some of the listeners are exposing themselves to, and listening to some of these doom and gloom, you know, podcasters that, that are not very hopeful. And again, I think they're they're losing sight, and I I wish in some ways they would use a platform to to show that there is actually a lot of hope. I feel a lot of hope. Um, do I think there's going to be a lot of loss? I do. I think there's a lot of loss, and and we're certainly seeing that with with lives that um, are being taken by the virus. Um, there's a lot of loss in the financial system, but I also, in the midst of that, see hope. Mm -hmm. and believe that God has something planned for this. I mean, anytime there is pruning, there's there's always life. And, you know, again, that's going to welcome all kinds of questions around suffering. But one of the things I'm actually really eager to get back to Dallas for, which is very different in Colorado because our spring comes different in Colorado, is I have every intention of going and pruning my rose bushes and cutting all my things back so that my my grass and my, my rose bushes and my um, perennials are going to be ready to bloom again. And I really look at this and what's going on as as an opportunity to see where growth can be and for us to practice and maybe use some muscles that we haven't used in a long time um, to get us through this. Wow, that's that's good, Liz. Hey, let's let's talk about the kids for a little bit because I, I mean, you're not going to find a, a kid's book on how to help your kids manage a pandemic. So this is all new for us in a variety right. of ways. So what are, what are some right. signs that we should look out for for juvenile stress? Uh, and then a second part in that is how do we have that conversation with our kids? What do we say? Because we don't want to say too much. We don't want to say too little. How do you find that good, healthy balance for the kids? For sure. For sure. The two main things to look for with kids is going to be they're going to probably go into one of two uh, places and, and certain types of personalities and kids are going to isolate more. Um, and again, it's, it's really reading your kid and paying attention to how they have been, kind of who they normally are in their personality. And then are they gravitating more towards isolating or are they gravitating more towards maybe even being outwardly agitated? always wanting to be near a parent or a sibling or challenging the boundaries of, well, I want to go to my friend's house, and they're, they're becoming more um, obstinate. And both of those are going to be two really common responses in that. And again, it's all about their brain. I mean, their brain is exposed. Um, it's an old quote, um, uh, you know, Jim Dobson, James Dobson, you know, great old Christian psychologist, but he has a fantastic quote that says, children are great observers but not good interpreters, okay? So, you know, when kids are starting to be teenagers, they're going to learn, to, they're going to be able to interpret more. But children are observing, and really about the age of two are when children are observing. And so they're, they're retaining this information. You know, again, it's not that I think two, four, or six-year-olds are going to be, are going to remember this, okay? They're probably not. But they're going to right now be aware, again, they can read a parent's barometer. 
they they are really good at that. And um, back in the day, I used to do uh, play therapy a long, long time ago. Now I work with adults. But, you know, I would see kids that would come in that had kind of been the sponges of what was going on with the parents. And so, again, it's a higher calling to parents um, to really, as best as they can, work on their own stuff. You know, I use the example a lot of times. And, again, flying is a whole deal on planes. But I've got to use the example of when you get on a plane and before you take off, the, the flight attendant gives the whole spiel that, you know, hey, if the oxygen masks need to be used, and if you're sitting next to a child or someone in need, whose mask do you put on first? And I would say half the time when I ask that, you know, in my office, they say, oh, it's the child's for sure. Yeah. But it's the opposite. You, you put yours on first. And so when it comes to helping kids, the best thing parents can do is put their oxygen mask on first. And, and then pay attention to the messages that they are somehow giving to their kids. Again, the TVs need to be off with young kids because even if, they're, if you're watching, um, or I guess, you know, if they're watching shows where the news doesn't cut in and say, oh, hey, a new case has just been exposed in, you know, Dallas County, that's one thing. But um, so it, it, it's paying attention to that. Um, some kids are really going to ask questions in the road to walk down with especially the older kids, is helping them see the differences, and this is really key, between what is possible versus what is probable. And, um, and, and to get real clear with that, because the reality is that, yes, th this is going to take off. We have no idea for how long. It could be a couple weeks and it starts winding down. You know, again, if you're paying attention to what's going on in China, this is already winding down. Um, I, my understanding is they've only had seven new cases in the last eight days, um, if, if my facts are, are correct. Um, so, again, this is winding down there. And so, you know, I think we will, we will see that here. But what's possible versus what is probable. And that might look different in how you engage that with a six-year-old versus a 16-year-old. Um, you definitely want to validate children's feelings. Um, one of my friends has her kids actually doing a lot of drawing out their feelings, um, the feelings that are good and positive, like this made me really happy today that, um, you know, and then to finish the sentence, or this makes me feel um, really fearful or really worried, and have a parent sit down at the table and just walk through validating feelings um, without, because you know, feelings can be like a balloon in us, and this is for adults too. And I and I pay attention to this when I have a balloon that's filled with stress or anxiety, and it's getting bigger and bigger and bigger, and it feels like it's just going to pop. And again, that's why I don't get on the news um, because I yeah. have that that tendency as well. I'm like everybody else. And so, with with children, you got to pay attention to where their balloon is. Um, again, if their balloon's getting really big, some children will isolate, and um, some children will become kind of obstinate and challenge boundaries and it's really about their anxiety so you want to give them a safe place to talk through their anxiety yeah you know it, it seems to me that parents have a, a really tremendous opportunity right now because we are home during the day at least for now um and you know what's our relationship like with our kids how cool would it be years from now for our kids to look back and say Boy, my mom or my dad was so encouraging during that difficult time. And what are some practices in your family that maybe we used to do, but we've kind of neglected? Maybe I've gotten so busy, I'm not doing some of the, the, the basic family hygiene things that I need to be doing. And so I would love to see, when you talk about one anothering, what are some practices your family could start during this time that you could commit to continuing after this is behind us? So. I like I like those those opportunities that uh, we have to to change our family dynamics uh, as we go through this difficult time together. Absolutely. I mean, I know families that are writing letters and they're sending them just just letters. They don't know necessarily who's going to get them, but they're letters to nursing homes. They're letters to assisted living. There. I mean, they're looking wow. how can they be selfless in it outside of themselves. I just talked to a friend of mine. Uh, she FaceTimed me and her kids and her, and her husband, they were sitting around the table last night after dinner, just, just writing cards and, and also to their own grandparents. I mean, it was, it was this, okay, how can we think outside of ourselves and move into the one another? And even if we don't know um, who that, that person will receive, will receive it. 
And again, I think it's, it's exercising muscles that we either have never used or we haven't used in a long time. And I think that's where opportunities come from this is, is what can we do? And that's why I think I'm so hopeful in this of, you know, what, what can we learn through it? Um, you know, if we think that suffering, um, you know, is all bad, it's a dichotomy. Um, it's, it's a, it's an incredible challenge depending on what kind of suffering, but I think it has an opportunity to remind us of a lot of things, remind us of our purpose, remind us of, of even what Jesus did for us. I think it can bring bring us into deeper reliance on God who does allow suffering. Um, yeah. I think it can bring us into reevaluating and reprioritizing our lives and finding treasures that maybe we've, we've never we've never experienced within our families or within our friendships. Yeah, that's good. So it, you talked about earlier about the control and well, we have a great opportunity for control here where we can choose to sit in front of the TV and watch the constant updates all day. We're not exercising, we're eating horribly, we're not getting a lot of sleep and we're bickering with the family. We're not gonna look back on these days and say, wow, that really went well. But on the flip side, if we right. do the things that you're suggesting and maybe start some things, do some cr really creative things as a family. I love the the letters to the nursing homes where we could look back on these days and say, wow, that was special family time. Uh, we get to choose. Uh, the virus doesn't get to choose that for us. We get to choose that ourselves. That's exactly right. That's where yeah. when people think they have no control over anything, I would say, ah, oh, we do, though. It's the dichotomy. Uh, yeah. Some things we definitely do, but there's some things that we do. And I think we have to look at this as a dichotomy, that there's pain and suffering, but how can we find contentment in the midst? Yeah, that's good. That's good. Well, what about, what about those that, uh, for the folks that may be wrestling with addictions uh, and how isolation can impact that? Uh, would you have any word, And because maybe we've got a team member that's wrestling with something, maybe they've got a family member that's wrestling with something. How, how about those folks that have an addiction? Uh, and again, the times of stress yeah. and a isolation that, that are put upon us. Oh, yeah, for sure. I have a lot of, of empathy for that because, you know, especially those that perhaps are working the AA program, you know, obviously they're, they've set that up to do it all virtually. But there is something about, and I have a couple of friends that, that are in AA and, you know, going to the meetings and, you know, being, you know, the word incarnate means within the body, right? And right now we're, we're kind of in some ways being forced into an, a disincarnation. You know, if we think, again, Christ came incarnate in the body and had this incredible three years of ministry, and now we're kind of forced into this disincarnation. And I, um, with my friends that go to AA, um, they are still moving into community and one another, and it just looks a little bit, bit different. Mm -hmm. um, I certainly think those that, that have addictions, um, again, most people want to numb themselves out. Um, those with addictions, um, you know, have done that uh, in, a, in, a, in an incredible, you know, serious way. And so, again, we can all numb ourselves out with the, the eating, the drinking, the pornography, the shopping, the social media. Um, I have a theory that anytime we use a substance, and that's whether we have an addiction or not, but we use a substance that alters how our brain works, it is because our current reality isn't good enough. And so then we, we think of addiction and we're like, okay, most of us wouldn't say that, hey, our, our current reality is, is great right now. And so again, what is the tendency for all of us? So even for those that are listening right now that don't have an addiction, I, I still think it's important to to kind of be mindful of how you, even if you don't have an addiction, might tend to numb yourself out. Um, and so it's that challenging, again, if you are working a program, stay connected to people. Um, know that there is grace, that if you have a relapse, if this is this thing because you felt more out of control over the last couple weeks with this and you have a relapse into your addiction, Try, do your best to not let shame and condemnation compound that, but move quickly into grace. Mm. Um, you know, uh, a few days ago, I watched that movie. Um, oh, what's it called, Henry? It's um, The Heart of Man. Did you Have you seen that? No, I haven't. It's about, it's a, 
Oh gosh, it's a phenomenal movie. It's it's really around just the seduction of of men in pornography. Um, but it's a phenomenal movie. It, it was uh, produced by really really incredible Christian men and women, and so it's they in in they weave testimonies through it. And while it was mostly around kind of um, sexual seduction and pornography, again, it's for anybody that gets drawn into something mm. that takes them further away from God. It, it's a phenomenal movie. It's a serious movie, so. Um, but it's such a hopeful movie, and I'm like, and it depicts going into numbness wow. and how God comes comes to us and draws us near and says, grace is for you, and, and my love is enough. But most of us, when we get drawn into something, um, again, whether it's an addiction or just a choice that doesn't glorify God, we go into shame, and then we right. isolate. And it grieves me because I do think that, you know, again, if we know from John 10.10, that the enemy wants to kill, steal, and destroy. Yeah. But then the second part of John 10, 10 is that Christ has come, that we can have life and life to the full. I'm over here thinking, man, I know that there are people that are living out the first part of John 10, 10 right now. And code of 19 was kind of the thing that threw them right back into it. And so Satan is killing, stealing, and destroying, which means they've relapsed into addiction. They have um, moved back into something that is not good for them. And then we look at the crisis come that we can have life and life to the full. It's this, it's they'll move back into getting support, asking for help, whatever that looks like so that they can move back into, I can have life and life to the full. Um, last week I, I read a book and if I can, can I give a plug for a book? It was a yeah, please. phenomenal book. Okay. So a guy named Seth Haynes, H-A-I-N-E-S. It's called the book of waking up. Experiencing the divine love that reorders a life. So Seth is a recovering uh, alcoholic, but it's not really even his book before this was really about his journey into recovery. This book is really for all of us because we all kind of want to go numb. Um, even before COVID-19 came out, we all have this tendency to want to just like go through social media all the time or just stay in front of Netflix all day Saturday or eat too much or whatever it is. And so what I appreciate about this book is that he brings it down to all of us and he says, you know, how can we reorder a life? And the timing of it for me to read it last week was just perfect wow. because I thought we, ha we have to reorder our life right now. And that is something that we have control over. Um, we can't reorder our external life and we can't reorder our, you know, fidelity retirement account. And we, we can't reorder um, all the things that got canceled on us. Um, you know, my good friend, her, her son, it's it his senior year. They they may not go back. We, we don't know. So, again, he can't reorder his senior year. Um, but it's how can we reorder our life with a divine love? And so, again, that's true for, for folks that are struggling, struggling with addiction. This does not have to be um, doom and gloom. But it also means that we can't isolate, and there is a there is a way we can stay connected to people, and not isolate in the midst of that. Well, that's good. Uh, I just looked the book up. It's got great reviews on Amazon. So uh, thanks for that resource. Uh, well, that's really good. Um, so uh, well, how about how about this? You know, we say we know that God is in control. Uh, you've said that a couple of times. So uh, what would you say to the person that would say, why would God allow something like this when he is in control? Yeah. Okay, this is a tough thing about being a Christian. Is that we have to suffer. Yeah. Um, there's no other way to try to some degree understand Jesus who suffered for us. There's no way that we can have kind of this scot-free life and all goes well for us and still have or value or be eternally grateful for a man who who literally hung hung on a cross. Um, and, and that's the hard thing. And I realize that when I say that, depending on where people are in their faith, because um, I do get that, that question a lot, um, that there's just no way around it. Um, and we have to get to this place of not liking suffering, but getting comfortable that suffering is, is coming our way. Um, Luke 22 is, is probably my favorite passage. Um, and it's the story of getting sifted like wheat. 
um, and out of all the Bible, and I think there's really rich things throughout all the Bible, but for some reason, this is my favorite passage, and I think it's because it's our reality until the day that the Lord takes us home. So Peter was a, a pretty half-hearted follower, um, and and yet he was the man that, that built the first church, and we read about him in Acts. But before he built that first church, again, he just kind of bobbled along. He was just, he was kind of a goofball in some ways, and, and he was always, you know, just challenging Jesus with things and, and was pretty half-hearted. Um, it was also when that rooster crowed that kind of woke Peter up. But So this is right before Peter denies Christ, and Jesus comes to him, and he says this to him, and this is the NIV version. He says, Simon Peter, Satan has come to me, and he has asked to sift you like wheat. But I have prayed for you that you will remain faithful. And when you have, go back and encourage others. Well, Piper has a really great paper on the sifting like wheat process. And um, if anybody mm -hmm. knows like sifting in the kitchen, I mean, you're sifting through stuff to figure out what the good stuff is to cook with. Um, back in New Testament times, you know, the women did do most of the sifting of the wheat. And they had these large barrels that were made out of twigs. Sometimes they were made out of clay. And they were actually about the size of a keg, if I can use that analogy. And they would literally shake them back and forth um, to sift out what they wanted to bake with and what they didn't. And so when I think about us getting sifted, I think about us getting put in a huge old sifter, okay, and God allowing it. But he allows it because it's always purposeful. Yeah. And the beautiful thing about that um, piece of scripture is that it says, Jesus says to Peter, and when you have remained faithful, go back and encourage others. And I, if you go back to the original Greek text, it doesn't actually say, you know, if you remain faithful or I hope you will remain faithful. It says, and when you have remained faithful, go back and encourage others. Yeah. And I think that's one of the most beautiful pictures of there is purpose in getting sifted like wheat that we would remain faithful and that we have an opportunity to go back and encourage others. And yeah, well, I love that. I love that sentiment. I when in 2 Corinthians 11 when Paul shares that he was, you know, five times he was uh, beaten, 40 lashes. I mean, the, the list goes on and on about the the trial that he's been through and that's encouraged so many people that I mean, how many times do you have to get beaten where you would just say, "Hey, I'm I'm out. I'm I'm en that's enough for me." But he continues, and so I think it's in those times of trial that we really get to inspire other people. Uh, at Interstate, we've had some folks go through go through some really difficult times. Uh, one was a former team member that was diagnosed with cancer years ago, uh, and the way she walked through that was just so encouraging and so inspiring. So I think when in times of suffering, just know that people are watching you and they're and they're saying, "Hey, show me that 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 faith is real." Uh, and so I think there's opportunity in the midst of that and knowing that there's always a purpose behind the pain. Uh, so I think, yeah, that's a, that's a good word for us, Liz. I appreciate hearing that. Yeah. yeah. Well, I love Paul's words in 2 Corinthians 1. I think it's 8. When he, as he writes, we were so utterly burdened yeah. beyond our strength that we despaired of life itself. Indeed, we felt that we had received the sentence of death. But that was to make us rely not on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. I mean, that's to say, you know, Paul, Paul gets it. You know, there's nothing new under the sun. Um, the COVID-19 name is a new name, but COVID-19 has, has been around forever, so to speak. And I'm not saying that little virus, right? But I mean, from the plagues on through, um, we've, we've all had things. Um, my parents were medical missionaries in Africa when AIDS was the new thing and my dad was a urologist and he, you know he was double gloving but you know 75 percent of his patients in this small little hospital um, at the base of Kilimanjaro were um, AIDS full-blown AIDS not just HIV positive but wow. um, and he was treating them and you know again I think because I've experienced some of my parents and how they've looked at this my parents now are 80 and 85 um, they are not worried at all um, they, they they've been through things like this before and they have always seen, uh, you know, um, oh, it's in Psalm 13, I believe, and I think it's 4, 5, and 6 that says, The enemy wants to overcome you, but you, O oh Lord, are faithful, and you have been good to me. 
and you know, I've gotten to watch my parents, you know, when they lived in Africa in the middle of that epidemic. And then I look and say, yeah, the enemy is trying to overcome. But how can we see and what can we identify every day of how God has been good to us and how he's been faithful? All while allowing suffering. So it's to validate the suffering, to validate the fears that we have. It's to, you know, say them out loud and to also recognize that there's another piece to the suffering. Yeah, that's a good word. That's a good word. Well, hey, as we start to wind down, is there um, what 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 I'd like to end on a on a really high note? Uh, and of course, what you just said was I'm not sure how much higher we can get than that. But what are some things that you've seen that have been really positive? Are there a couple more that you you've talked about a couple throughout our time? But are there are a couple other things that you've heard that uh, encouraged you today? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, Actually, I, I read something and I, I looked it up to see because I'm really particular, like if I read stuff on the Internet because so much stuff is sensationalized. So I think this is true. And this was just out this morning that the waters in Venice, OK, typically in the canals are always pretty muddy and dirty because, um, you know, the motorboats are always going through with all the tourists. I mean, it's a beautiful place if you've ever been there, but they are always muddied waters. OK, I read today that this is the first time that anybody can remember um, in years that the waters in the canal are clear. Wow. And it's huh. beautiful. And people are taking pictures because they've never seen the waters like this before. And I thought, gosh, okay, I get it. In the midst of loss, I get it. People are not able to work. Um, but what can you see is is just that there can be beauty in, in the midst of this. Um, I did pull up, a friend of mine sent me this who lives in Spain right now, so she's she's facing a lot of this stuff. And um, an Irish priest wrote this poem uh, two days ago, and, and I'd love to read it because it's actually oh, depicting what, what he's experiencing. Um, he lives in Spain, and so he's, but he's writing about what he's hearing about on the news and what he's experiencing. And the last part of this is, is just showing the beauty of it. So he, he entitles this lockdown, and here's what he writes. Yes, there is fear. Yes, there is isolation. Yes, there is panic buying. Yes, there is sickness. Yes, there is even death. But they say that in Wuhan, after so many years of noise, you can hear the birds again. They say that after just a few weeks of quiet, the sky is no longer thick with fumes, but blue and gray and clear. They say that in the streets of Assisi, people are singing to each other across the empty squares keeping their windows open so that those who are alone may hear the sounds of family around them. They say that at a hotel in the west of Ireland is offering free meals and delivery to the housebound. Today, a young woman I know is busy spreading flyers with her number through the neighborhood so that the elders may have someone to call on. Today, churches, synagogues, mosques, and temples are preparing to welcome and shelter the homeless, the sick, the weary, all over the world, people are slowing down and reflecting. All over the world, people are looking at their neighbors in a new way. All over the world, people are waking up to a new reality, to how big we really are, to how little control we really have, to what really matters, to love. So we pray and we remember that, yes, there is fear, but there does not have to be hate. Yes, there is isolation. But there does not have to be loneliness. Yes, there is panic buying, but there does not have to be meanness. Yes, there is sickness, but there does not have to be disease of the soul. Yes, there is even death, but there can always be a rebirth of love. Wake to the choices you make as to how you live now, today, breathe, listen behind the factory noises of your panic. The birds are singing again, the sky is clearing. Spring is coming, and we are always encompassed by love. Open the windows of your soul, and though you may not be able to touch across the empty square, sing. I thought that was beautiful. Wow, that's awesome. Well, that well yeah. said. Yeah, yeah, written by an Irish priest. He wrote that on, actually, he wrote that on March 13th and sent that to a friend of mine. Wow. Boy, that, that's tremendous, Liz. Thank you so much for sharing that. 
Well, hey, is there is there sure. one question that I haven't asked you that I should have asked you? Gosh, I don't think so, Henry. Oh, well, good. Think, I mean, I would certainly, if there were time to, you know, if, if anybody had questions, I'm certainly open to that. I, I think we touched on it. it, it there's always hope. Yeah. Um, there, there's always hope. Um, I'll, I'll tell you, there, there's a quote that might help people. Uh, Corey Ten Boom, um, you know, she helped hide her family, you know, the Nazis, and she was in Auschwitz in um, one of the prison camp, camps. And um, she has a quote that I love that says, I hold on to everything loosely because when God pries open my fingers, it hurts. And so I mm. think, again, how do we hold on loosely in the midst of this? And I think when we can learn to do that, our hope can be restored in a, in a good God who, yes, he allows suffering. He does. But it's always purposeful. Yeah. It's always purposeful. Well, that's it. Liz, thank you so much for spending time with us today. That was, uh, uh, I had high expectations, but uh, they've been exceeded by the conversation today. So thank you so much for giving up your time for us. You got it. Hey, we're just, as C.S. Lewis says, we're, we're all fellow patients in the same hospital. Yeah. Uh, we're just trying to figure this out. So um, we're just trying to figure it out. Yeah. Good. Well, hey, for those that are listening, we'd love to get feedback from you all on uh uh, uh, on anything you you have during the, during our conversation, so we'd love to hear from you. Uh, but let me, if I could, pray us out, Liz, and uh, I hope you enjoy the rest of your time in Colorado and safe returns back to Dallas. Thank you. Thank you okay. so much. Okay, Father, thank you for our time uh, today. Thank you for Liz uh, uh, giving up her time to be with us. That uh, that she is a fellow patient as we walk through this uh, journey of life. Lord, I pray that you'd bless her for her labor today. Uh, she's encouraged my heart, and I'm sure she's encouraged the hearts of others as well. Uh, I'm excited about those who are not on today, but will get a, a video or an audio recording of our conversation. And so we just want to say thank you, Father, um, for this uh, season that we're in, in the midst of the trial and the heartache and the fear and the anxiety, and and for some, sadly, the, the loss of death. I pray that uh, we would find purpose in the midst of this pain that uh, we would grow uh, closer in our families and our coworkers and uh, grow closer to you. And I pray, Father, that all of us, as we um, play the role that we have, that we would glorify you as we as we live these days. So thank you for our time, Lord. We're, um, I pray for a, a blessing of an afternoon for each of us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All righty. Thank you, Liz. Okay, Henry. Take all right, care. Take care. Okay? All right, you too. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.